Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. Rob Fazio about his new book, Bully Proof, Using Subtle Strength to Influence Alphas and Strengthen Society. Dr. Rob Fazio, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me on, John. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from outside of Philadelphia. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. Today, we're going to be talking about your new book. It actually will be released here in about a month, Bully Proof, Using Subtle Strength to Influence Alphas and Strengthen Society. A really interesting title. I'm super excited to explore this with you and its implications uh, for leadership and organizations. As we get started, I wanted to share Rob's bio with everybody. Dr. Rob Fazio is a leadership psychologist and executive advisor at On Point Advising, an author of Simple is the New Smart and the Motivational Currency Calculator. He specializes in global leadership and organizational success. He has over 20 years of experience advising on power and influence and motivation with elite and emerging talent. His advice on navigating turbulent times and politics has been featured in the New York Times and on CNN, Fox News Channel, and MSNBC. Based on his background, sports psychology, he empowers clients to remove internal and external barriers to organizational effectiveness and to function at optimal levels. During the COVID-19 crisis, he advised hospitals and executives on how to keep people mentally tough and grow through the experience. He has coached executive teams and talent throughout organizations, including the C-suite, surgeons, athletes, and emerging leaders. He is a licensed psychologist and founder of the nonprofit Hold the Door for Others. I love all of that. That's tremendous. Uh, you've, you've done a lot of really cool things. Anything else you would like to share with me and my listeners before we launch on into the conversation? No, just that I have uh, two little girls, Ray and Reese, um, and uh, it's a lot of fun negotiating with kids. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. I, I also, I'm a family man, six children. I love oh. my kids. I love my family and spending time with them. And it's always an adventure, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. It's so funny. You know, we're both in this organization space. And, you know, I, I think if I, I had to write a book at home, it'd be called disorganization, right? Like everything you learned that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Kids, kids throw it all out the window, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> well, very good. As we get started, um, why don't you tell us uh, about the why behind this book, Bully Proof, and why you chose that uh, main title? Yeah, I think that the, the purpose for this book actually came out when I was writing it, because, you know, every good book advisor, consultant tells you, you really have to demonstrate your purpose and people want to get to know you. And I had to, I had to think about it a while and it, and it, and it hit me. I remember being at a, a hockey game with my with my dad um, in the in the eighties. He was an executive in New York, and we were we were talking about his boss. And he would never say it, but I could tell that he was always stressed out and anxious around this person. And years later, I learned that this guy was a manipulative bully CFO, really dysfunctional. And I think I just became empowered by wanting to not let other people experience that and find a way to help leaders and organizations to not create dysfunction and push people around for, yes, productivity in the workplace, but also in their home life so it doesn't carry over. 
Um, and then the, the title of the book, gosh, it took me years to kind of nail it and figure it out. But one day I was running and um, just this idea of, of being bulletproof came in my head of like bulletproof vest and being not letting things impact you. And then it just kind of clicked like, oh, bulletproof. There, there we go. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's excellent. And there really is a, a good amount of literature out there, uh, some practitioner work and some academic work that looks at, you know, there's, there's this concept, the total cost of assholes, um, yes. you know, asshole rule, right? You may, you may be familiar with that. There's toxic leadership work that's out there. The bottom line is, it, this is, this is a problem. And most people have experienced it. Most people have experienced manipulative jerk bosses that cause a lot of problems within organizations. And, and sometimes it's not intentional. Sometimes it is. Um, and, and it's not always bully behavior, but certainly it's unhealthy. It's psychologically unhealthy. It's, and it it disrupts team dynamics and productivity and all those sorts of things. So it's definitely problematic and we need to learn how to address it. So I think that's great. And I like the way you, um, the way you frame it up there with your title. So kudos to that. I know coming up with a good title can be challenging. It, it, it can. And everyone's, it's kind of like naming a kid, right? Everyone, like, you don't want to say it to the wrong person because they'll kill it, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's, that's a great origin for the book as well. And again, I, I think it's a super timely and important kind of a topic. Uh, we need to just learn how to do better with this, right? And certainly just, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with my kids' school. And I don't know the age of your children, but I have six children, um, grades three through senior in high school. And so I've seen them as they've gone through and to see the focus that schools put on bully education, bullying education, and like making sure that there's a zero tolerance rule, you know, an approach to bullying. It's been really great because I don't know how it was for you, but when I went through school, it was prevalent, right? It just, you see the shows and the movies. That's, that really is how it was for me. Like it, it was, it was all around. It happened all the time. And I was, uh, you know, sometimes I had to, to deal with it myself. Unfortunately, there may have been times where I was a jerk to other people. Um, the reality was that was just more commonplace back when, when I was going through school. And I'm glad that for the most part, my kids haven't had to deal with that. How wonderful would it be if we got to a place as a society where we could have workplaces, we could have organizations where there's zero tolerance for bullying <laughs> and that yeah. people can just treat each other with dignity and respect and with kindness. That would be amazing. I would love that. It, it would. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a heavy lift. You know, I think younger children are in the best spot because the norm is to not bully. And if you're bullied to support people that are bullied and stick up for it. And it's almost like in today's age, my daughter's six. If someone bullies it's it's right away, boom, the parents are involved. Um, I think that, you know, uh, our generation, you know, generation X and everything, it's it was so common in the workplace. I can't tell you how many executives I have to have conversations around, um, not even zero tolerance, like that would be aspirational, but it's, it's rather than putting someone on a PIP three times, right, really leading them out of the organization and making those tough calls. Um, and the, the cost is huge. I mean, it actually in 2010, there's a stat by the American Psychological Association that it, it costs US companies $300 billion. And I don't know what the current stat is, but I'm guessing it's more. Yeah, it's it's probably a whole lot more. We're, we're probably approaching, you know, half a trillion, right? Um, and, and the reality is, this is a huge, huge problem. Uh, so let's figure out how to, to make it better. Uh, just like, you know, in, in schools and for our children, it seems like it's getting better, at least it, where I live, it certainly has been. And hopefully it's getting that way for other people as well. Um, so let's talk about how do we do that within organizations? And your subtitle, you say using subtle strength to influence. So it's, it's using subtle strength uh, to influence alphas and strength in society. And um, what I found is Right. We know interpersonally there is a continuum of how people interact. And so um, I created something called strength styles, which essentially is a continuum that ranges from being submissive, then towards subtle strength, overt strength, and then dominance. And when people bully or interact with alphas uh, that may or may not be bullies, 
they tend to either avoid, which is submissive, or attack, which is dominate. And that pulls us into a, a reactive state as opposed to a creative or collaborative state of mind. And so realizing that part of it is not personalizing when you have the experience of being bullied and realizing it's more about the other person than you. And I think that something people don't talk a lot about is um, we actually need to do things that empower people to, to navigate bullies, but also take ownership to not get permission and to have boundaries around when you're mistreated. I think so many people just take it because they feel like they're stuck. And all that does is get permission for more bullying. And that's, that's the worst thing, right? Like when bullying behavior happens and it's not addressed, and then there's this perception that that's just our culture, that's the style. Um, And some, and I've heard, I've heard leaders justify it, you know, as, as this is just, we have more of an aggressive, high octane culture, they'll say, or something like that. And that, that's, you know, can you be high octane? Can you be like results driven and not have a bullying culture? Yes, absolutely. You can. And so, so getting to the place, getting to the place where we can um, address the behaviors when they happen uh, and not give either implicit or explicit permission for them to happen by addressing them, uh, then that can make a big difference. The problem is we, so often we observe these things, nothing happens. And usually in my experience, the only thing that happens is to the person who speaks out about it and then they get bullied further. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so there's a, a stat by uh, the Workplace Bullying Institute, uh, and they they estimate that about 67% of people that have a job that lo- they love that get bullied still leave. And so, I mean, how unfortunate and is is that? And you're right; it does it does often go unchecked. And what I the whole alpha thing is that you could be an alpha and not a bully. And um, there, there are different types of alphas and the, the type of alpha I try to get people to align with are alphas that are aware and adaptive. In other words, they know that they're alphas and they, they use their powers for good. And what that does is it neutralizes the unaware, non-adaptive alpha, the person that just doesn't care. Um, and so, you know, people will say, well, I'm not assertive enough to become bullyproof. And, and that's actually not true. You can, you can build alliances with other people that have similar ambitions as you. And that tends to, to kind of hinder the progress of the bully. You know, the, the rest of your, your, um, your subtitle is strengthening society. And in this case, we're going to zoom in on society. That's a big, big thing, right? We're going to zoom in on strengthening our organizations, within that broader societal context um, by coalition building, by, by finding people who can be your support, you can protect yourself from these types of bullying behaviors so that you're, you're more bulletproof to the, the effects that they can have. And you have people with your watching your back, you're watching their back, uh, uh, et cetera. What, what are some of the other things we can do to proactively address when we see bullying behaviors happening, especially if we happen to be in a somewhat toxic culture where it's just kind of expected, it's the norm, people just kind of tend to roll with it and never gets addressed? Check out my new book, The Future Leader creating and transforming next-gen organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, The Future Leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill 
for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. So I think that um, I think that there's a, there's a couple things that are really important. One of them is um, there's some great uh, great literature out there on successful intelligence by Bob Sternberg, and I, I really adapt a lot of his frameworks. But he talks about the idea of the different types of intelligence, and one of them being practical intelligence. So I equate it to as fit fight or flight. So if you're in a situation you're, where you're being bullied, um, either you know, it's a fit for you and, and it works for whatever reason, or you've got to fight to try to change the environment. And the thing that I see people doing the least is if they keep getting beat up by a bully and they can't change the situation, it's not a fit. They don't know when it's a flight situation and they quite simply need to get out. Of course, there's situations where people can't leave, but I see many situations where people do have opportunities and they stay stuck, almost like in an abusive relationship. And, and some people, you know, the way they respond to narcissists is that they, um, they feel like it's their fault or they feel like they have to change the person or help them. And that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, organizationally, when I think of, of power um, from a perspective of when you have it, how to use it and so you don't lose it or become abusive, there's four facets to it. So there's self and having self-ambition, which is good and fine. You want to be motivated. And then there's others, which might be your team or people around you. Then there's the organization, which might be the, the business. And then there's society. And everything that we're seeing around allyship and, and, and building coalitions is that awareness is no longer enough. I can't be, hey, John, I know that there's a gender bias or I know that there's racial differences and everything that no longer works. We actually have to take action. So what I try to do is lay those four facets around awareness of those. And am I taking action to make them better? And like you said, ultimately, uh, we just have to be proactive about this. And I like the way you break that down into those different components, because that's, that's a helpful kind of typology and framework for thinking about the different, the, diff, the different areas. Um, so as, as we continue to move on in looking at your book and, and what you're trying to address with the reader, what are some of the other key takeaways, the key principles or components that you think would be most valuable to highlight here in our remaining time? Yeah, I, I think that, um, for let's take it from the perspective of if you're experiencing bullying, um, just like in any tough situation, you need to have hope and a plan. So believing that you can take some ownership um, and not fall onto a, a victim mentality and having some sort of a, of a plan. And one of the you know, planned approaches that, that I take is uh, really understanding your motivational currency, which is what drives you, whether it's performance, people, power, or purpose, and making sure you're having opportunities on a daily basis to nurture those and be engaged. And then also being able to um, read other people's motivators, because when you do that, you could communicate in a perspective, in a way that um, isn't threatening to them. If you're using language that is important to them. And then another thing I do uh, try to teach people to do is, is use this framework um, called deals. So when someone goes in and they try to influence an alpha, as I mentioned, they, they try to take them head on or they completely become submissive. And the acronym deals is D is for depersonalize, which is the hardest step in removing yourself from feeling like this has something to do with you. Uh, because we're all in some ways think about ourselves and are self-absorbed, but many times it has zero to do with the recipient of the bullying. 
The second is the most controversial, which is empathy. And what I found is you need to change the pattern and dynamic with a bully because they are so used to people being exhausted from them and not wanting to engage them in conversation. And when you are actually empathetic and try to understand them, uh, they change the way they interact with you. And then the A is uh, align. So align with something with, with the bully, even if it's for a short period of time saying, wow, I really appreciate why you want to accomplish this. Um, and that often decreases the emotional reaction and, and creates some opening. And then looking for the hook, looking for something that an opening for something where you can um, uncover what's, what's really important to them, what motivates them. Um, oftentimes bully gets, bullies get tired and you've got to be patient and find that opening. And then the final is show strength. So I think a mistake a lot of people make is they'll just go along with the billing or they'll be dominant. But if you can show strength, like subtle strength, where you ask a question that might be somewhat assertive, you use humor to point something out, but demonstrating some strength in a way, and there's a continuum, kind of like a gas pedal where you might be pretty subtle and then you might be overt and say, you know what, John, I really didn't appreciate what you said that. Can we agree that we won't talk that way anymore? Yeah, I think that's helpful. And showing that strength, Man, that is challenging. And I have to admit, I'm a, I'm, I'm more of an introvert. I'm more of a, uh, perhaps a more passive when it comes to conflict with other people. That's my natural tendency. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to speak up and to speak out and challenge people um, in a group setting. You know, when I, when I think that there's other people that probably agree with me, but maybe they're just scared to speak up. So that's not something I'm scared to do. Um, but to be able to directly uh, confront somebody in a one-on-one setting when something has happened, my tendency would probably be to, to let it go and to try to just, you know, turn the other cheek, forgive them, try to, you know, just put my head down, focus on my work. The problem with that is that you're enabling those bullying behaviors and they're just going to continue. And so how, how would you coach someone or, 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 uh, guide someone who might have that kind of a tendency um, so that they yeah. can show more strength. So interestingly enough, um, other than people who are pure alphas, um, most of us are like that, right? We're human beings. We want to connect. We want relationships. And, and that gets in the way of us having direct conversations. I, I'm the same way where, you know, I could coach someone through a conflict like a ninja. But when it comes to me and it's personal, I get awkward. I'm like, I'm like, I, I, I rationalize why it's not important to surface a conflict. Like I'm brilliant at talking about it out of myself, having a bullyproof conversation. And I think that's admitting that I think could be very powerful to people that you're working with and that we, a lot of us struggle with this, um, but that doesn't make it okay. And something you said, I think is the key. Because people like you care about other people, the organization and society. And that's, that's where I find the hook, where I have conversations around, if you're letting this happen to you, is it likely it's happening to other people? How do you think it's happening, influencing other people's um, home lives? And so this is where the value-based power comes in, is where I really try to, to trigger their value system to help them build the comfort and confidence to take it on. And there are times politically where it's not smart for that person to take it on. And that's where the asking questions to fellow colleagues and, and seeing if other people are having that, it might be finding a peer or someone who is as high as the other person in the organization positionally to, to try to take that on. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I like how you say you're a, you're a ninja about these things when you're coaching other people on how to do it. It's, it's, it is something entirely different when it's you in the hot seat, isn't it? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that really can be a challenge. Um, but you're right. Yeah. It, this is it generally human nature. Um, and, and so we have to, we have to push ourselves to be appropriately strength-based in, and respond into these types of situations, especially if there's a pattern um, that has emerged, you, it's not going to magically stop. Like it, you have to actively disrupt it uh, or it will continue. And so get, get your coalition together, get, you know, if, if you're worried about trying to do it alone, get other people to support you, do it together, strengthen numbers, all of that. Uh, and that really can uh, help you to, to start to make the difference. 
Well, Rob, this has re- been a really fun conversation. I know at the time it has flown by. We've only scratched the surface and there's so much more we could uh, talk about from your book, um, but we're going to have to wrap up for today. Before we close though, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, where they can find out more about you and your work and where they can find your book and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so where they could find me, um, LinkedIn, you know, Rob Fazio, I do usually a a weekly one minute or less quick tip on something related to leadership. Um, Getonpoint.com, I have a lot of free resources, video blog, things like that around around the topic. Um, That is good. And then um, I think you said a final thought. Was that, did I miss anything? Uh, So for a final thought, you know, I, I looked at a lot of the work around having a vision and people talking about their why, which is really important. But where most people fall down with achieving what they want is in the how. And so the last chapter in the book is Finish With How. And I go through the the literature around how important is to plan for obstacles and how important is to be aware of your habits that bring you closer to your goals and away from them. I love it. I love it. Rob, this has just been a lot of fun. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected with Rob, check out the book. Uh, And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer than Indigo Leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.